on behalf of the Zionist Council of New South Wales, thank you for joining us and welcome to tonight's talk with US filmmaker, media personality and activist, Ami Horowitz. The Zionist Council is very excited to be working with Ami in our advocacy space over the next 12 months. Tonight, Ami will be discussing the rise of the new anti-Semitism that is emerging from the far left, why this is happening and what it means for Jews throughout the world. This will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by our Executive Director, Tanil Murray. So if you have any questions for Ami, can you please type them in the group chat? And now a bit about Ami. Ami produced, directed and starred in the highly reviewed theatrical film, You and Me, a documentary about the failure of the United Nations, which was one of the most talked about documentaries in recent years being released theatrically and broadcast on television in 15 countries. He also produces edgy and powerful YouTube and Facebook videos that have garnered over 500 million views and that have affected global change, including the direction of US trade and education policies. His work has been covered by nearly every major publication in the world, and he is currently an on-air contributor to Fox News, creating satirical videos and expert analysis on a variety of topics. In addition to Fox News, Ami has appeared on Access Hollywood, CNN, NBC Nightly News, Morning Joe, the BBC, NPR, Russian Today, among many other national television programs. In Australia, he is a regular on Sky News. Ami is also clearly not averse to placing himself in some risky situations in order to highlight and bring attention to important issues. He has traveled with Syrian immigrants across the Aegean Ocean in a rickety raft, has been shelled by Ivorian rebels and shot at by Islamic Jihad, to name just a few. Would you please welcome Ami Horowitz. Thank you so much for that. I really, truly appreciate it. Um, so it's a pleasure being with you guys. Um, Australia was not massively on my radar. Um, for many, many years or most of my life. And then all of a sudden the last three or four years has become a bigger part of my life. Uh, and I, I travel regularly to, um, to Sydney and Melbourne when of course your country isn't uh, banning all foreigners from coming in. So I look forward to Australia being a free state again and allowing people to, to come back in country and I can be there in person. Um, so as you can tell by my bio, I, I have uh, quite a bit of experience um, regarding a number of issues, but in particular when it comes to anti-Semitism, both on a personal and a professional level. And the truth is much of what we're going to talk about now is going to be uncomfortable. And uh, I apologize for that in advance, but I think it's, um, it's important that we speak freely and openly about it because that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in. And um, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. I live now in New York. I grew up in, in uh, 80s Los Angeles. And to be honest, it was, um, it was not a comfortable time to be a Jew. It wasn't, there wasn't massive anti-Semitism around the city, but there was a, an element of anti-Semitism that we all felt. And um, it was, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Every year, my synagogue or my school, I went to a Jewish school, uh, would be defaced. And um, there'd be Nazi swastikas uh, around the school, windows would be broken. Again, not every month, but once a year, you can count on it happening once or maybe twice. And that was throughout the 80s. And then something happened around the 90s where it just kind of went, went away. And you didn't see outward examples of anti-Semitism on a regular basis, really anywhere in California. And we entered this kind of, um, this Goldilocks period, if you will, for about 20 years, where there really wasn't a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism, certainly not a palpable sense of anti-Semitism around the country. And we have unfortunately uh, left that Goldilocks period. Uh, we are now in a situation where Anti-Semitism has resurged, anti-Semitism is back, anti-Semitism is palpable, and not just the US, but around the world. And um, it's something we have to deal with. 
We have to understand where it comes from, how it's metastasized. And this is really important because again, going back to when I was a kid and anti-Semitism was happening, it was the exclusive domain, almost, ex almost exclusively by the far right, the skinheads, the neo-Nazis. Those were the ones who were engaged in forms of anti-Semitism. And what we see now is it has changed radically over the last, you know, since it's newer surges, of, let's say over the last five or six years, maybe 10 years. And while the, the, while the far right, the extreme right is still very much anti-Semitic, that hasn't gone away. They're not the, by any means, the, the, the major purveyor of anti-Semitism. That has come from two different groups, the far, the far left and, um, and the Islamic community, the radical Islamic community, or really you could say the Islamic community, unfortunately. And this is kind of what anti-Semitism has, has become. The growth anti-Semitism, if you're buying a stock and you're looking for what the, growing, the growth factors are in that stock, uh, yeah, they're still in that business of the far right of anti-Semitism, but the numbers is what's fascinating. The far right, the neo-Nazi, the KKK. Now, if you listen to some people uh, in America, I don't know what's like in Australia, they make it seem like this is a massive, massive... Okay, I'm, were you guys able to hear me or was I muted for some reason the whole time? No, just the last 30 seconds or so you were muted. Okay, that's weird. Because I don't think I didn't touch anything. Okay, so what I was saying was the growth in anti-Semitism, right, is, is not coming from the far right. The far right exists, they're still there. But in numbers, they're relatively, really they're minuscule. If you look at um, the KKK or, or neo-Nazis, you're talking about the thousands, the thousands. If you're talking about the hard left, and, and, and the radical Islamic, mostly the hard left, you're talking about in the millions. And uh, not to say that all people on the hard left are anti-Semitic, it's not really true, but I hate to say the hard, now I differentiate when I say the hard left, that doesn't mean left of center. So I want to define terms here. It doesn't mean liberals, right? Liberals are nothing like the hard left. Liberals and conservatives agree that the United States is a good thing, and that the United States needs to be better and stronger. They just disagree on how to get there. The hard left, which again, I wanna emphasize, numbers in the millions, and they have power in this country, true power, in the halls of Congress, in the Senate, um, some might say the vice presidency, um, they, uh, they don't care for the United States, to be honest. Uh, in fact, most of them find the United States to be the fount of evil in the world. And they really want to see the destruction, certainly the complete reshaping of the United States. I could talk about my experience within that as well. Um, and that's what I call the hard left. And that's where the anti-Semitism has really come from. Uh, this is not actually new. The truth is that the, if you want to look where the, the birth of the left, you can look at the Enlightenment. I think the Enlightenment, most people would agree, most historians would agree, was the birth of the left. And anti-Semitism was born with the left. Voltaire, one of the great leaders and thinkers of the Enlightenment was a rabid anti-Semite. Uh, he looked at Jews and said, his hatred of Jews came from, from his anti-religion, anti-religious zeal. And that he thought that the Enlightenment was the end of Christianity, but the Jews, since they're separate from Christianity, would always carry the light of God. And they were the, they were the witnesses of the birth of Christianity. And he wanted to see the Jewish extermination because of that. Um, and, and, and I think that it's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why the left has become anti-Semitic, both then and now. Um, they still carry the hatred of, of, of Jews because of our religious um, perspective, even though ironically, Jews are far less religious than, than most. Um, we're also particularly divided. We're not a monolith here in the United States at all. Although one of the great things I love about Australian Jews is that even though um, you guys may disagree on, on politics, there may be Jews on the left, Jews on the right, the one thing you guys all coalesce around is, is Israel and that um, 
being a proud Zionist, as your name suggests, is something that people don't shy away from as Jews. In fact, they embrace it. Here is very different. Uh, it's been it's been probably 20 years since we we do polls on 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 Jews and what their issues are. It's been probably 20 years since Israel even ranked in the top 10. It's now way outside the top 10 in terms of things Jews care about. Um, but it's also economic things. So, and there there's a um, I'm assuming you guys are familiar with the term intersectionality. If you're not, I'll describe what it is. And intersectionality is another reason why anti-Semitism is, is resurgent among the left. It's the notion, it's, it's one of the most, um, it's, one, it's, it's, it's a term that probably carries one of the, probably the most currency among the left. What it essentially means is that all people who are victims, all people who identify as victims are interconnected. And it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how different you are politically, culturally, religiously, if you feel like a victim, you are connected to each other. So it's the reason why, when it comes to Israel, you would wonder why would gay people and radical Islamists be an allies to each other, and they are, when it comes to Israel. And it's because they all say we're victims, therefore we're, we're connected together. Uh, and it's quite sad. In fact, I have a video coming out uh, soon about the gay issues in the LGBT, the LGBTQ community and what's happening in the Palestinian territories. Uh, and when I interviewed uh, gay people around the country here in the US, uh, by and large, it was that the views you had were scurrilous lies about Israel. It was quite unfortunate. I hope this video will start to make a, a, a dent in that. So intersectionality has, has brought these, dis these disparate groups together on a lot of issues. The hatred of America is certainly um, foremost on that list because they view Israel at the United States as the reason why they're victims. But Israel is a major issue as well. It's the reason why if you go to a climate change march, climate change march, right? It's nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with Jews. You will always, always see one of the largest groups marching are pro-Palestinian anti-Zionist marchers. Now I can go into the whole thing about BDS and that being anti-Semitism, but I won't in this in these remarks. If someone wants to ask me about it, I'll speak to you about it. But They'll take us off into a little bit of a, bit of a tangent. Maybe I will at, at the end. Um, so these groups, these, these intersectional groups, if you will, to use their term, coalesce around a number of issues and Israel and, and, and the, the power of Jews is another one of them. Uh, I think it's clear, I think everybody's familiar with the resurgence of anti-Semitism on our campuses. Uh, in the United States. I'm assuming it's, it's like that in, in Australia. I know, I, I know your system is a little bit different than ours. Here, most everybody, the campus is their life for four years. They live on campus, they eat there, they learn there, their friends are there, they party there. And in Australia, it's a little bit different. There's not as many people who go away for four years to college, but here that is, I don't know what the number is, I think it's like 65% of all Americans go away to four-year college. And Anti-Semitism has taken hold of our college campuses in a real way. I'm, I'm talking a really significant way. Uh, and again, it's not anti-Israel, although it's that as well. The, the needle is, 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 has moved toward anti-Semitism. I'll give you a, an example of that. And it's, uh, it's actually one of my prouder moments, to be honest. Oddly enough, I was sitting on a beach uh, in Australia. I was on Bondi Beach. And uh, my phone rang with this message that there was going to be an anti-Israel, the, 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 ostensibly it was um, the issue, the topic on campus was going to be uh, uh, Gaza, the, the Gaza conflict. So I assumed that was gonna devolve into an anti-Israel hate fest. And it was being sponsored uh, oddly by Duke and the University of North Carolina. I say oddly because they're rivals. They don't work together very much at all, in fact, uh, like I said, they're, they're rivals in sports, they're rivals academically, geographically, they compete for students, but they're doing a, a joint conference. It was a, it was a major conference, excuse me. And normally that doesn't move the needle for me because I hate to say it, anti-Israel sentiment on campus is so rampant that usually I say, well, you know, it just, I can't go to every anti-Israel, you know, event, otherwise that is what I do full time and I still wouldn't cover it. But something, as I was sitting on that beach in Bondi, something in me said, I think this might devolve into something more or I could expose something more. So uh, a couple weeks later, I flew to um, 
uh, UNC, University of North Carolina's campus. That's where it was being held. And I can't stress to you how, how large this event was. This event was sponsored by every major department and school at the universities, the School of Law, the History Department, the Medical School, the English Department. I mean, literally every major department and school were sponsoring on the sponsor list and, and gave money to this, to this event. And then even more so, the US government spent a quarter million dollars of federal funding on this event. So I went and it was the usual, you know, claptrap of Israel is bad, Israel is an aggressor, Israel is a colonizer, Israel, 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 all the Palestinian problems are Israel because of Israel. Okay, uh, again, bullshit, but doesn't really move the needle all that much. I hear that all the time. But then I started, I had a hidden camera and a hidden mic, and I started asking the participants on campus questions. And I wasn't asking the Islamic uh, students because that was, that, that food is too low hanging and, you know, it was too on the nose. So I was asking, like I tried to normally do, ask white students, some black students, but mostly white college students and professors. Started asking questions like, um, what do you think of the, and again, I talk about Israel, I talk about the Jews. What do you think about the Jews? Um, do you think, the, the, you know, and I started getting answers like, well, we're, the, we're in the world that we're in now because of the Jews. You know, the Jews control governments. The, the Jews control wars. The Jews with their, with their wealth are funding all of these problems. This is what they were telling me when they thought they weren't being filmed, right? I'm not talking about radicals. These are not crazy people on the right. These are students and professors at a major, major university event. And um, the coup de grace of the video was I went to the event that night and they flew in a speaker, a, a pal uh, sorry, a, a, a rapper, Palestinian rapper. And uh, he was flown in from Israel and uh, he, was the, he was the culmination of the entire event. And he got up to a full house in an auditorium and he began rapping. And it was dripping with anti-Semitism, overt anti-Semitism. At one point he goes, let's be anti-Semitic together. It's wild standing ovation. You guys aren't being anti-Semitic enough. Let's take it up to 10 anti-Semitism. And people are going crazy for this. And I'm filming this thing and I'm just my jaws drop, right? I, I mean, I don't get shocked that often anymore, but I was just floored what I was seeing. So thank God. Video came out great, came out clear, sound was great, and I released the video. And uh, as sometimes my videos do, um, they make significant news. Sometimes they'll make, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll, they always make news. They always, my videos average, thank God, five, six million views per video. But sometimes, and you never know, there's no rhyme or reason, sometimes they just explode. They'll do 10, 20 million views. You get on the front page of the New York Times and the LA Times. But, you, but that doesn't happen all that often, maybe once a year, and you never know what that video is going to be. This was that video and it exploded. And it was the front page of New York Times. And um, I get a call from the Department of Education and the representative at the, at, from the DOE asked me for the raw footage. I said, of course, I sent the raw footage. And um, I didn't know at the time what they were gonna do with it, but it started making news a couple weeks later. They sued Duke and UNC for the money the quarter million dollars they spent. They sued and they very quickly settled out of court. And, the, and there's a, it's an important reason behind that. What happened was, this is behind the scenes, I didn't know about this until later. What happened was, um, I don't know why it keeps going mute. Uh, where did I leave, where, where did I drop, where did I drop off? Uh, only 10 seconds before when they're, they're suing. Okay, so they, so they sued um, Duke and UNC and they settled out of court. And the reason why that's important is unbeknownst to me, this is behind the scenes, it came out later obviously very publicly, um, and I only found out about it publicly, was Nancy DeVos, who at the time was the head of the University of, uh, sorry, the, the part of education. She went to Donald Trump at the time was president. And she said, look, we settled out of court and the reason why we did, and we didn't go to court and make this public, we would have lost. We don't have a legal mechanism to sue them for money that they spent, federal money 
on anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism isn't covered. Now, if you look at Title IX, or like Title VI, uh, which, is, which was a landmark um, uh, executive order, that it covers a whole list of things, racism, uh, misogyny, anti-Semitism is not covered. So what the president did was he then signed an ex very publicly and loudly, and it was a major issue in the Jewish community. He signed very publicly, he amended Title VI to include anti-Semitism. And it was a big deal, made, again, front page news. Uh, there was a signing ceremony at the White House of Hanukkah that I was honored to go to. And it really changed a lot of, this di of these dynamics. It hasn't, hasn't fundamentally changed the dynamics, so the headwinds are so massive. But now, and it's starting to take root, now, if there's anti-Semitism on campus, which happens all the time, you now, as an individual, have a mechanism to sue the school, which makes the schools have known about this anti-Semitism for many, many years. They, they, this is not unbeknownst, but they did nothing to stop it. And what's happened now is they have to take notice because what it's doing now is, is actually making it difficult. For, they'll, they'll, get, they'll get sued and they will have uh, financial issues, both pub, a PR issue and a financial issue. So it was a really very important uh, executive order that President Trump had signed. And I'm, I'm proud that I, I, I played a role in that. Um, again, not to say that it's, it stopped, the anti-Semitism on campus has continued, but it's changed the playing field a little bit. Um, now the anti-Semitism, again, like I said, has metastasized as the, the major driver coming from the left, not the right. But the problem is it's not just some individuals on campus, some yahoos on the street. Anti-Semitism now has taken hold of the of, of large chunks. Again, I don't want to overstate this. I'm not saying that most of Hollywood is anti-Semitic. It's not true. But you have major, major players in Hollywood who are openly anti-Semitic, posting Nazi-type memes, literally. Some of them are literally Nazi memes. Uh, I don't want to go through all of them. There are tons of them. They're rappers and they're actors and they're sports stars. May now, I'm not talking minor people. I'm talking major players. Unfortunately, none of them have faced any kind of, and this is the, this is the craziest part, um, and I can't speak as to what this truly means. I mean, if you are a racist and you are a person in Hollywood sports and you post something truly vile and racist, you will lose your job. You will be canceled. You are out. And full stop. And there have been some examples, but not many. Um, but for some bizarre reason, this, you get a pass on anti-Semitism, which is obviously bizarre because, you know, a lot of Jewish people, let's, let's be honest, there's a lot of Jewish people in Hollywood. And uh, these people still continue to have su successful careers. You have open anti-Semites in the halls of Congress. Open, not, not hidden. We've always had that. I mean, we've had anti-Semites who are Republicans. We've had anti-Semites the Democrats. Although I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate, that if you went back 30, 40 years ago, most of the anti-Semites in Congress were Republicans, not Democrats. That is flipped. There are, there are virtually no anti-Semites who are significant Republicans. And the one, the, there's one example of a woman um, who is, uh, she, she's pleading me a couple, but she, I think could be considered anti-Semite and she has been frozen out of any of the major, I mean, she can't be, you can't, you know, she was duly elected, so they, she can't be dismissed. But she's been frozen out of any kind of Republican activity whatsoever. But if you look at Ilan Omar, if you look at Rashida Tlaib, um, uh, Cori Bush, these are people who are not just not just not frozen out of the Democratic Party. They are on the front page of Rolling Stone magazine. They are lauded by the Democratic Party, and it 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 it's greatly troubling to see her hugging and shaking hands with Nancy Pelosi, who's in no way anti-Semite. Nancy Pelosi's not even a woman of the left. She is very much um, a, a, you know, left of center, a little more than left of center, but she's in no way associated with the hard left. But the hard left has become so powerful in the Democratic Party. They are beginning, I'm not saying they control the agenda completely, but they are having significant effects. Joe Biden is, again, by no means an anti-Semite. He's by no means a man of the hard left. He's always been center left, but you can see in his agenda, and I don't want to get too political here, but you can see in his agenda as well, that a lot of what the hard left's policies, their agenda points that they've been trying to push have been adopted by this administration. Again, not to say that he's a, a hard leftist, he's, he's not at all. Um, and 
it's it's a it's a massive 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 issue. Um, I, I don't want to again. I want to open for Q and A, so I don't want to take too much more time. But I'll talk about a couple very briefly. Um, a lot of this is driven by economics, if we want to be honest. And what I mean by that is the main agenda of the hard left is a restructuring of the of the global economic system. They want to see, and this is. This is not me, um, this is no this is not hyper, 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 hyperbole at all. I hate to say it. They want to see the destruction of, of the capitalist system across the country, full stop. This is the agenda of the hard left, the main agenda of the hard left. Part of the intersectionality, which I referred to before, is that the people in the pyramid, right? So if the wealthiest are on the top and the, and the bottom of the pyramid is, is, is the poor uh, who make up most of the world, um, that pyramid isn't really true in the United States. It's kind of, uh, it's not, it's in, the poor are not the major percent of the population. They view, the, but they view it that way and they view the world that way. So I mentioned only because that's their, that's their worldview. Therefore, the people on the top are by definition oppressing the people on the bottom. That's how intersectionality works. That's, that's the left's agenda. In their view, if you are on top, you are definitionally an oppressor. And they look at Jews, they all the Jews are rich, right? Another anti Semitic trope. Therefore, by definition, you Jews are our oppressors. That's also a major driver. And unfortunately, they have done a very good job, the hard left, in inculcating this belief among the black community in America. Uh, again, not all black people are Semitic, far, far from it. But the percent of black people who are in Semitic is rising significantly. And you have seen it, unfortunately, um, you've seen the results of that on Jews being beaten in the streets in New York and Los Angeles and in other parts of the country. Literally, you see Jews being beaten by black people across the United States, um, spurred by Black Lives Matter, which is, and if you want to talk about it in a QA, I will. Black Lives Matter as an organization, and I just finished an expose where I spent a year with Black Lives Matter, is an openly anti Semitic organization. I can't make this clear enough. The movement, the, or, the organization of Black Lives Matter, the leadership are anti-Semites, not anti-Israel, which they are. They want to see the destruction of Israel, which they've called for publicly. They are anti-Semites. And it's unfortunate that a lot of people have taken on the Black Lives Matter mantra who are not anti-Semites because they don't understand what's going on. But it is a, the, it, we have a massive problem in the Black community in America. And I've done videos on this. Again, it's not in any way, shape or form, a majority of Black people, but they have had significant traction on it. And if you see the vibe, and one last thing on the Semitism. So we don't, we understand what we're talking about here, the problem, the scope of the problem here in America. There is more per capita anti-Semitic events in America than anti-Black events, anti-gay events, anti-Muslim events, anti-Asian events, anti-trans events combined. Not individually, combined. And it's growing. It's not growing, it wasn't growing just during Donald Trump. That's just untrue. It was growing during Trump, Donald Trump's presidency, but it began during Barack Obama's presidency, probably the, around the beginning of, of his presidency, maybe a little a couple of years after. Since the left's agenda began taking hold and becoming more powerful, that has moved exactly with the rise in anti-Semitism. The rise of the left, of the hard left, has moved exactly with anti-Semitism. So uh, with that, I will leave the... Uh, the formal comments, and uh, I will take any questions that you guys may have, if only if they're sycophantic. I'm Thank kidding, you. you guys can feel free to criticize. I may ignore it, but you can criticize. Thank you so much, Ami. We've got a lot of questions that have come in, and I'll sort of start from the beginning. We had a couple of questions. Um, one came in from Orner and another from Eddie. It's sort of how do you define and explain anti Semitism and anti Zionism among Jewish people? And another one, what are your thoughts on Jews being anti Israel? Uh, this is from Eddie. I believe anti Israel equals anti Semitism. Okay, so uh, the first one is about Jews, and the second one is just generally about how you, you, you close the loop between anti Semitism and anti Israel behavior. Uh, well, he was more specifically referring to Jews who are anti-Israel. So um, let's not forget the reason why both of the, the, the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed twice 
And it was destroyed, as we know, because of Sinat Chinam, hatred of your brother. And um, if you look historically about, in both those examples and other examples of times where we have felt and had and faced destruction among our enemies, oftentimes the person who was, who let them in the door were Jews. I hate to say it, but again, this may be uncomfortable, but this is what we're, in, and this is the most uncomfortable of all questions, situations is the situation among our own people. Um, Jewish self-hatred has never been, it's never, not something new. It's something we've dealt with for many years. And, and this is an example of, of, of self-hatred. And unfortunately, they are right. This person who asked the question is right. A lot of it does come, not the open anti-Semitism, but the support for anti-Semites comes from the Jews uh, for two reasons. One is sometimes they don't fully understand or refuse to believe the anti-Semitism of their partners. Other times they fully understand it, but they're opening the door to it because of their self-hatred and uh, their hatred of religion. Um, their, their, the belief I mentioned before, how economics is oppressing the world and they're full believers in it. And it's, again, not to say that the majority of Jews feel this way. I think very few Jews in, in, in Australia feel that way, but a significant minority of Jews in America feel that way. This is nothing new. Again, the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians, they were all partnered with Jews in Palestine. They were the ones who were brought in. Um, and uh, this is in fact happening now. This, there is an absolute connection between them and it, 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 it pains me a great deal. So if I haven't, whoever asked that question, if I, or anybody, if I, if I haven't fully answered that question, uh, let me know. I can, I, I can expand more on it. On the issue between Zionism and anti-Semitism, so, so people like to play games. Ah, ah, I don't hate Jews, I hate Israel. Okay, so it, I have a very simple definition on where you stand on hatred of Israel and where you stand on anti-Semitism. It's a very simple test. You could, you could play this one at home if you like. You simply look at the person who's anti-Israel and say, well, are you as, vo as vocal, or are you vocal at all, about other bad actors around the world. Are you as vocal against the, 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 the country-sized gulag of North Korea? Are you as vocal against um, the mullahs of Iran? Are you as vocal against uh, Palestinians who are throwing gay people off of roofs? If you are equally vocal on those as, Jew, as, as Israel, okay, Israel is not about criticism, even though you may be criticizing for things I don't personally agree with, you have every right in the world to criticize Israel. But if you criticize Israel to the exclusion of the other bad actors, obviously Israel is not a bad actor, but you perceive it that way. Guess what? You're an anti-Semite. I did a video one time where I went, one of my favorite videos, didn't do as well as my others, it was a little bit early on, but really one of the videos I, I cherished the most. And I went to um, Ireland. Ireland is, uh, and Scotland really are two of the places in, outside of, of the Palestinian territories which really embraced and began BDS. So I went to three major companies that are su full supporters, open supporters of BDS. And I went there and I had a hidden camp. And I went as a, a seller of products to each of the, of the ownership or the general managers of these companies. And one was a major chain of booksellers. And uh, one was uh, the largest co-op in Ireland. And one was actually the, the two other companies, significantly large co-ops places around the country. And I spoke with, with, the, with the owners and I, and I, you know, at one point I said, I, I'm, I sell, you know, one guy said, pardon me, uh, I, I'm selling these leather diaries from North Korea. Another place I went to, I was selling, selling from Sudan and then I was selling pistachios from Iran. I kid you not, I don't know. I, I guess I'm a chameleon. I passed for, they, they had no problem dealing with somebody. That, I don't know, I, I can't believe they thought I was, but these are stupid people to deal with, so what can I tell you? And in each case, I said, um, Will you buy from me? And they said, of course, we have no problem buying from you. Why would we have a problem? And I, and I pushed it. I said, well, you know, in North Korea, I said, he, they, at one point the guy said, why are these leather diaries so cheap? I said, well, because we make them with, with uh, gulag workers and we pass the savings on to you. And he goes, oh, that's great. And then, I kid you, that's not, a, I kid you not. At one point I was talking to a woman, I was selling pistachios from Iran. And I said to her, you know, these come from Iran. I go, how, how much do you care about, um, Global warming, climate change, oh, that's uh, one of our major issues. I go, great news. Uh, we use the, 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 um, the political prisoners who we use to, on our farms have a very small 
You get a very small uh, carbon footprint. You can have almost no water and electricity. So that's great. That's great, right? No irony whatsoever. And um, and then when I asked them, um, hey, do you do you um, do you buy from Israel? We deal with Israel, and they said absolutely not. We would never, ever, ever buy something from Israel. So that says it all. If 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 you believe that, you're an anti-Semite. Thanks, Ami. Um, we've got another question. We'll move on to the left here. So the question is, how much influence, I'll give you two parts. Number one from Ron, how much influence does the squad have in the Democratic Party in promoting anti-Semitism, anti-Israel attitudes? And then part two will come from Sandra. And then why do Jews support the left? Uh, I'm sorry, why do, who supports the left? Jews, Jewish people. Oh, why do Jews support, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. um, and the first one was the, the first one was the power of uh, the left in the Democratic Party, correct? The squad, yeah, the left in promoting those anti-Israel, anti-Semitism kind of rhetorics. So, um, to the end, I'll leave it to you to remind me if I don't get to the second one, if I just if I forget the second one. Okay, because it's, it's, it's an important question. So the first one is unfortunately quite a bit of power. And they don't dominate the Democratic Party yet, but we are on the precipice of that happening. So the, the, there's the Corbynization of the Democratic Party, right? It's the, it's the it's, you know, how, how, how Corbyn was able to remake the Democratic Party in his own hard left anti-Semitic image, um, which they're trying to recover from now, um, unsuccessfully for the most part. Democratic Party is going through a similar process. Um, in numbers, they don't have the numbers, the hard left, um, but in theology, they are gaining power, significant power. And again, you can see that in, and I won't go in, into specific policies of this particular administration, the Biden administration, but you can see it in, in, their, in their policies. You can see it most, again, I don't wanna, I don't wanna get too political, but um, I will say that it's, 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 it's significant. And they are, rock, they are the rock stars of the Democratic Party. They are, look, if you ask people who are Democrats and say, who's the future of the Democratic Party? They will absolutely point to the squad and AOC and Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib and Cori Bush and, and, and the whole lot of them. They are the future of the party. And the future is now because nothing gets done. It's not like they're able, even though the, 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 the center left and the Democratic Party still holds a majority, but they still have to kowtow to the hard left. And I, I'll use the hard left, the squad is just an embodiment of the hard left. I don't wanna get too caught up in, in, in name tags. The squad is just a popular uh, phrase and group of the hard left. Nothing, 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 nothing gets passed without the hard left's approval. And when they don't, they have a massive internal fight. Uh, and again, I don't want to go into particular policies, but certainly with Israel, all all the issues around Israel, um, this has been the case. Uh, the the and uh, the only uh, I mentioned this about Biden. Um, so when Israel was having its conflict with Gaza and responding to to Gazans shelling Hamas shelling Israel, and Israel defended itself, the initial reaction of the president and the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, was a traditional democratic response. Israel has the right to defend itself. And we have to separate the people who are attacking as opposed to the people who are defending, okay? And it was a good statement and people were very happy with it. Soon, I'm talking the next day, the hard left got a hold of the administration and they walked back, not completely, but they walked back that statement a bit. And this is, you're going to, and this is just the, the absolute beginning of the administration. You're going to see that influence more and more not only among the Democratic Party in general, but among the administration. As opposed to the, the Jewish question I get all the time when I speak to non-Jewish people, especially you know the, the evangelical Christian community, right? That's the number one question. And the answer is, um, I don't know, the answer is, uh, if, you, if we move aside what I said before, and I usually don't get into the dirty laundry of, of Jewish self-hatred, and historical self-hatred. So I don't get into what I talked about before with most of them. Um, I do self-censor a little bit. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I will say this, that with Jews, because of our history, 
we have always viewed, we viewed, we viewed our politics through the prism, through the lens of social justice because of our history, right? It makes sense. We have been oppressed for so long. We have been the oppressed for so long that we view everything, every, I mean, this is, this is a, a collective mindset that we've had for thousands of years. We view everything through the prism of social justice. I'll take the American politics, politics as an example of that. Jews were always staunchly Republican ever since Lincoln because they viewed the Republican party as the party of social justice. And then the time of, of uh, Roosevelt, the second Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, it flipped, it was like a switch. And the Jews never looked back, solidly Democratic. Now I, I happen to believe they're wrong about how they, right, they're maybe right about how social justice is a focus of the Democrats, but as I happen to think that the Democrats have screwed up poverty in America badly. That's why we're seeing what we have now. Um, but that's the, the Jews have always looked at the world that way, continue to see the world that way, the majority of Jews. And they, they, they wrongly identify with the left because they seem to think that the left are the champions of social justice. Following on from that, Stephen asked, do you classify Black Lives Matter as hard left? Absolutely. As hard left as they go. Right. Um, the destruction, I mean, if, if you think the destruction of, of capitalism is as hard left as you can go, the embrace of, of it's not play games, it's not socialism, it's about communism um, and Mar really Marxism, because communism has some political issues they don't care about. They're, Mar they're openly Marxist, they'll admit to it. The one person who's not a Marxist, one of the founders said to me, very interestingly, I'm not a Marxist. I believe in every Marxist principle, but I have to be a religious person and Marxism is anti-religion, religious. So therefore I don't identify as a Marxist. But otherwise I agree with eh, the entire Marxist agenda. They are as hard left as you get. Again, I, I know it's not maybe politically correct. I know it may upset some people, but as somebody who has spent a year a full year embedded with them, traveling with them, going to their riots, they're, they're going, interviewing the, the, the founders. Um, they are as hard left as they get. They, they truly want to see the destruction of this. Now, again, I'm, I'm speaking about the leadership uh, and their agenda. Now, there's a lot of people who march, a lot of Jews who march with Black Lives Matter who don't believe that. Uh, but the organization itself, and it's a significant organization with chapters around the country, they almost top to bottom, are hard left who believe in the total destruction of the U.S. system. Econo and this is, this, is, this is, if you watch the video, they tell me this, economically, politically, judicial. They want to destroy the entire judicial system, the court system, all of it. They want to tear it all down. They're destructions. So, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I know I didn't, probably didn't ask that question directly. So, I'm sorry. I beat around the bush. We've got a great question from David here. You know, and it's true, we hear Israel, startup nation, startup nation, the tech nation. Why were so many talented people in tech in Israel and Jewish people? Why is it that we're losing the propaganda war online? It's interesting that you mentioned tech in that because tech doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, just because we have a lot of technology doesn't mean that we lose a propaganda war, but it's fascinating that you brought it up because they are, it's, it, they're interconnected in this sense. It's a very strong sense. Why um, famously Israel is phenomenal in technology and horrible in marketing, right? We all know that famously terrible in marketing. The reason why they're terrible in marketing is because the Israeli attitude of, look, I made the best product. You know, it's the best product. I know it's the best product. What am I spending money and time trying to convince you is the best product? It just is, you have to buy it, right? That's the Israeli attitude. And the same goes for Hasbara. It's changed a little bit. And I wanna be clear, and I'll, I'll ask this in a second. Uh, I'll get back to it in a second, but the Israeli attitude has been, look, we know we're right. We know that we're defending ourselves. We know we're, we're the good guys. Why don't I have to spend my time trying to convince you we're the good guy? It's obvious, we're the good guys. Same attitude, same problem. It has changed a little bit. I want to be clear about something. It's a little bit of a misnomer that uh, Palestinian propaganda, Palestinian, okay, the Palestinian propaganda is excellent. Palestinian, uh, if you ever watch Talking Heads, if you watch a Talking Head who's Palestinian and, and Israeli, there's no comparison. The Israeli wipes the floor of the Palestinian. They, they don't know how to form an argument well. They don't speak English well. They're terrible. 
But the reason why they're winning the online propaganda war and the social media war is because, let's be honest, they have an easier message to sell. Victimhood is really easy to sell, right? People are willing to buy that stuff. It's an easy argument. It's simple to understand that they get it. Uh, saying we're defending ourselves, even though it sounds pretty obvious to us, it is a much more difficult thing to sell than straight up victimhood. They have the advantage on the argument itself. And we have to counter that. We have not done a great job countering that, frankly. Um, but that's why in the propaganda social media online war, it's just an easier, they, they, they come from a higher, the higher position, the easier position to deal with because it's, a, it's an easier product to sell, to be honest. That might relate well to a question from Orly. She asks, how do we relay information about Palestinian governments without it coming across as derogatory? What is a good approach to take when seeking to explain things like payments to shahids and issues like this? Yeah, uh, don't shy away from it. Um, it is uh, not, it, it's, it's, yeah, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't look and say, I gotta be very careful how I word this stuff or what I say, right? That's not really what we should be doing. We should be honest and straightforward, but you've got to make your argument and you've got to make it right. Uh, we have, you know, look, we are in the sense of Israel, we are in the right on most, on not all this stuff, but most of this stuff. Um, and because of that, I think it's important that we, we, we do, we, look, you are all, in, I have a, a, a particularly um, significant platform uh, to kind of walk through and explain my position, but all of us have our own platforms, some big, some small, some just friends. Um, and it's important that we do that. It's important that we, we continue to push the agenda that we know that is right um, because we are right. And you have to always speak up for what is right. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I answered that question right. We'll go to a question to from Sorry. Yossi. So Yossi says your movies have been shown in Australia that JNF hosted you and you do know our country quite a bit. What do you have to say about the Australian media and Australians in general regarding the coverage and the feeling towards Israel compared to the same in the USA? So media coverage and general feeling towards Israel. So it's not, you are on the back end of the curve um, as we were as compared to Europe, right? I think Europe has led this anti-Israel agenda the U.S. followed, and I think Australia is following behind the U.S. So you're not quite where we are. Um, I mean, look, your media also has. I, I've been just besmirched by your media, so I, I know, and I, I, I've been besmirched by my media, you know, the European media. So I know firsthand that your media is somewhat problematic. It's not as bad as it is in the U.S. Well, your media may be similar to our media, um, but uh, I think what I, I have found that by and large people are a little more supportive of Israel than they are than they, than they are becoming here. But you can also, again, I, I think you're on the same trajectory that we're on, unfortunately. Um, and by the way, I don't, I don't wanna make it seem like we've lost the argument, we haven't. This is a winnable argument. Even when it seems like it's been lost, it can still be won. I mean, if you wanna give a, a, a terrible example, Marxism is a great example of how that was lost, that ideological battle was lost and it has totally, you know, become resurgent. I, I'm not. I'm hoping this is not a 50-year-long battle like it was for reclaiming the the uh, prime the, the primacy of Marxism on the left. But uh, I'm hopefully this will be a much shorter run. But you never know, and it oftentimes depends on the advocates of that position. Um, so I, I can't stress enough. It's all about ad advocating your position strongly, loudly, um, but respectfully. Uh, you know, I, I remember a story about, I was in England, and I was meeting with uh, Lord Levy. Lord Levy, we were having dinner at his palatial estate. I don't know if you guys know, he is one of the most powerful people in England. Um, truly one of the most powerful people in, 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 in England, in Great Britain. And we're sitting at his massive, massive estate, we're having dinner. And, and I asked him, you know, it, was, it was a number of years ago, a little more naive then. And I asked him, I said, I, I, I don't get something. You know, us Jews, we activate. We, we advocate loudly and unapologetically in, in the U.S. In, in the halls of, literally we'll walk halls of Congress, we'll sit down with the Senator and we'll say, 
not quite wag our finger, but pretty close. Um, why, what's going on? Why, why aren't you guys doing that in, uh, in England? And he looked at me, he said something, I will, to the day I die, I'll never forget his statement, his response. It was, I still feel like I'm a guest in this country. An unbelievably sad yet powerful statement coming from one of the most powerful people in the world on this palatial, massive estate that probably cost 50 million pounds. But it said a lot to me about the European mindset and about their inability to advocate properly and look what happened to them. The same is not for the US. We still are loud and proud, but a larger segment of our group is waning. And you can't let that happen in Australia. We've got a question from, Richmond, uh, from Richard here. And he says, with all this in mind, how do you see the long-term future of American Jewry? Um, I should have a very easy answer, which is great. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm pausing on this. Um, it's too difficult to say. I'll be honest. It, it all depends on the direction that this, that this country, that the US goes in. If the country decides, and we're on the precipice, if the country decides to move to the left, and that becomes the default position of the Democratic Party, which it hasn't quite yet, um, and therefore then begins to drag parts of the center toward their agenda. Um, the long term or the medium term to long term process for Jews are no good. Um, I'm confident that it won't come to that. I'm confident that it, it will not be that. And long term, it will be just as comfortable for Jews now as it is then. Um, Again, just going back to that Lord Levy comment, I was just so astonished by it. I mean, I, I, I thought to myself, in a million years, I wouldn't consider myself as an American, as a, as just as American as the guy, as any guy I come across. Wouldn't even occur to me 20 years ago when this conversation happened. Wouldn't even occur to me. It was just astonishing. Do I feel that way now? That in, in, in 20 years, my kids will feel the same way? I'm not 100% sure. If I had to bet money, I would say yes, but I, it breaks my heart to say I'm not 100% sure. And in the interest of time, we've got one last question. We've had a couple of people come in, um, Orly and wow. Eddie, asking about what's quite topical right now, COVID. So there's a lot of conspiracies linking the Jews to spreading COVID, the vaccine, Pfizer, comparisons being made in Australia with the Australian lockdown being, what Eddie says, comparison is being made with the lockdown during COVID, comparing with the suffering of Jews during the Holocaust, both in the media and by politicians. Eddie is a Holocaust survivor himself. So what is your comment on all these conspiracies and how this COVID seems to come back on the Jews as well? Well, uh, again, unfortunately, um, all bad things that happen in the world end up boomeranging on the Jews. This is nothing new. Uh, it will unfortunately always be the case. It's just human nature to hate people who are you look at as different and most importantly, you look at as more successful. Okay, this is, again, a lot of this comes down to economics, honestly, not as much about religion. Um, and this is, if you really look at it, it really is, again, it's a whole different discussion about, about how this is all breaks down economically versus anything else, but okay. So I did a video. Um, okay, so when it comes to, let me, let me take a step back. When it comes to people comparing COVID to the lockdowns for the Holocaust, that doesn't, look, it's, it's, a, it's a dumb comparison, obviously. It's a stupid comparison. It's not an anti-Semitic comparison for the most part. They're not doing it to make a point about how much we hate Jews or how the Holocaust wasn't as bad as, it's not really it. We, we, we tend in the world, oftentimes use the term Nazi or Hitler loosely, right? He's a Hitler, you're a Nazi. I've used, I've used Nazi in a, in, a, in, a, in, a loose, in a loose term. We do it, people do it. Uh, because you know, it's obvious, Nazis represent the most evil, so you're trying to over compare something. That doesn't bother me as much. It's a stupid comparison, obviously. Um, it's not intimate. Does it trivialize the Holocaust? Of course. Um, uh, but it's not, it's a little bit different. In fact, it's fundamentally different than the other side of the COVID Jew equation, 
is that the Jews are involved in spreading it. That is true anti-Semitism, old school anti-Semitism, which leads to people dying, being killed, straight up. I'll give you an example of another video I did where at the right with the, you know, this is like April, May, right? Maybe it was the end of May, right? Right in the middle of COVID, you know, thick of COVID, you know, lunacy because we were all didn't, we were all so scared, we didn't know anything about it. I flew to Minneapolis. I had a hunch. I went to Ilan Omar's district. But I never stopped traveling. I traveled from never once stopped traveling because of coronavirus. In fact, flying is one of the safest things you can do. I've flown since coronavirus started. 30 times, never even got it. Um, so I fl flew privately, actually. The first couple of times I flew, I was on a plane. I was the only person on the, on the, on the airliner. Um, so I flew to Elon Omar's district and I was asking people, these are people who voted for her. Uh, and I said, who started coronavirus? Where did this come from? Overwhelmingly from her community, this is the Somali community, I got the Jews. The Jews, 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 Jews funded it. They started it, they spread it. They're, in part, they're partners with the Chinese and Russians on creating it. It was incredible. It was so, it was absolutely incredible. It was distressful. Part of the problem I have with YouTube, with social media is they, they end up um, pulling some of my videos. They end up all putting them back eventually because they realize that they're wrong. This is a video that they, the social media worked hard to suppress. They only got a million, two million views. Usually I get double, triple that. They pulled it for a while. They, they smartly, they did it because um, it, was get, it was getting a huge amount of momentum. And then when you pull a video, even when you put it back, when I, because obviously they were wrong, I put pressure on them and they realized and they put it back up, you've lost the momentum. They, they sometimes, will, that's a game they'll play. They'll pull a video and they'll they lose this momentum, they'll put it back up. That was a video they did that with. But it was an incredibly, um, and it made, a, it made some news, obviously, incredibly scary video where they're just, they're telling you straight up, right? These are people who've left. The Jews, Push coronavirus. Now, there, that's that's also people on the right who believe that. I'm not trying to downplay the role of the right, the hard right, and anti-Semitism. The reason why I don't spend time with the right is because they really, truly have no power in this country. None. Not in the halls of Congress. Not in the media. Not in entertainment. They are a small. And I, again, I, I'm saying like they probably they don't. The, the hard right is a number, probably numbers in the hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand people. Not anywhere near a million. Um, who believe in, in the, in the anti-Semitic dogma of the hard right I'm referring to. But the hard left, who believes the same thing on the other side, um, they're in the millions. That's why I keep talking about the hard left and not the hard right. So don't get me wrong, the hard right is as anti-Semitic as it's always been. In fact, I did a video one time where I compared the hard left views, the hard right views, where I actually interviewed students on campus. This is about, not about Jews, but about race, about black people. And they were saying things which to me sounded very racist. And then I went to the, a leader of the KKK in North Carolina, I asked him the same questions. He gave the same exact answers. It was incredible. In fact, he was like, I love these kids. I can't believe they The kids on campus have finally gotten where I've been preaching for years. It was hilarious at the same time, quite troubling. So anyways, I hope that answered that question. Well, I'll just throw in one last question, Nami, before I th we thank you very much for your time. Just Rodney has the, Rodney, you can, you, you can always do that. That's exactly right. What's more daunting, interviewing Hamas or talking to 200 Australians in lockdown? <laughs> I will tell you this. Your country is crazy, man. You guys are nuts. I truly, oh my God, what is it with this lockdown? I don't know how you guys aren't revolting in the streets. I don't fully understand. Truly, I don't fully get it. Um, Look, in New York, which is, you know, relatively bad in terms of the restrictions, it's pretty unrestricted. I mean, I, you know, it's even in New York and in California, there are some restrictions, but it's pretty, for the most part, unrestricted. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather be, I'd rather hang out with Hamas. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm also not in the lockdown. I'm in Israel where there's 8,000 cases running a day and everyone's still out on the street. So it's quite interesting, the, the differences. But I mean, really, thank you very much for getting up at this ungodly hour of the morning for you in uh, New York. It's uh, really been a very thought-provoking um, session. Clearly, we've got a lot to be concerned about, and there's an abundance of work for all of us to do in our communities, building resilience in our youth, and um, countering the endless misleading statements and lies being put out there by the masses. 
Um, so we really appreciate your time and effort. And just on that, I'd also like to mention our next session will be in October with Arsen Ostrovsky, our Israel Director, and Alex Rivkin from the ECAJ. And it'll be on BDS, and we're looking mainly at the legal slant of uh, BDS. Um, we'll put out details very shortly. But again, thanks everybody for joining us. I mean, again, thank you so much. And Shana Tova to, to everybody. Um, and keep well and keep safe. Thank you very much. Shana Tova. Thank you. Bye. Bye.